Hi, my name is Raquel Baldelamar, and welcome to the Mega Podcast, where I speak with high achievers on how they fulfill their professional dreams while maintaining balance throughout their lives. Today, I am speaking with Lauren Gibbs, an Olympian silver medalist at the 2018 Winter Olympics and a two-time gold and bronze medalist for the World Championships in bobsledding. Born and raised in Los Angeles, Lauren has been active in sports since she was young. Growing up, she did track and field and soccer and played volleyball at Brown University. Although she was physically active her whole life, she never intended to be a professional athlete. After college, she took a job in sales and quickly became financially successful. Yet, with her high-paying job, home, and dream car, she felt stuck and unsatisfied. Her life changed when her friends suggested she try out for the bobsled Olympic team. She knew nothing about bobsledding, and at the age of 30, she worried it might be too late for her to professionally compete. But she knew it was such an incredible and unique opportunity, so she went for it. She quit her job, sold her car, and moved to Colorado to train. She won an Olympic medal. Now, she trains almost every day, competes, and has multiple sponsorships. She is the spokesperson for Parity Now, which is an organization that advocates for financial parity in women's sports. She is also vice president of partnerships for the personal growth app Heroic, which launched in April 2022. Lauren, welcome to the Mega Podcast. Thanks for having me. I always feel like my intro is so much more impressive than I am. <laughs> well, I don't think you realize how impressive you are. <laughs> Why, thank you. You had a path to the Olympics that was very different than most people. Most people who are Olympic medalists, they started training at a very, very young age. Tell me about your path. I tried it as a joke. Uh, I was 30 years old, I was living in Denver and my friend came into a CrossFit gym that I was working at it and said, I think you should bobsled. And I said, absolutely not, that's not a real sport. Um, but I'd made a promise to myself to fully vet every opportunity that came to me. So I hate hypocrisy. So I was like, I'll look into it, you know, surface level research it. It'll probably be very clear very quickly that it's not gonna work. And then I can just, you know, check a box and move on. It turned out there, there are Olympic training centers all over the US and one was holding a tryout that was about an hour away from me. And so I thought, how cool would it be to take a tour of an Olympic training center? And in the process, sure, I'll try out for the team, you know, just to have a good reason, good enough reason to be there. Um, and I guess the rest is history. So I guess the joke's on me because uh, <laughs> I've done this sport now for eight years. Uh, this last season will most likely have been my last. We'll see if I make a comeback at some point. So you didn't have like dreams of a young girl just playing in the Olympics. It wasn't like something you really thought about. I mean, you were very active in sports, yeah. but what you weren't really, you didn't think about, I'm gonna, I wanna be in the Olympic team. I mean, I think every athlete at some point in their career dreams about being an Olympian, um, but I'm five foot 10 and volleyball was my main sport, mm -hmm. so. I started playing volleyball very late as well. I started my sophomore year of high school, was lucky enough to play in college. And, you know, I graduated from college in 2006. There weren't a lot of opportunities for professional sports for women. So sports for me was always an opportunity to get into a great school and then, you know, hopefully catapult to a great career, which I did, just didn't like it, so. You said you felt unstuck. You, yeah. felt, you felt stuck. Mm -hmm. Describe that, because you had, you had one on the surface appeared just, a great life, yep. a dream job, car, house, and then you just, you felt unsatisfied. Yeah, I mean, I, I think deep down, I could have lived that life and figured it out and been fine. You know, it's like, you know, after that last two years of, of life, you realize what really matters and like all my basic needs were met, but I just was bored. <laughs> and so, um, which I think is a very, privileged thing to be able to say, oh, I'm bored at my job, so I'm gonna go do something else. You know, not everybody has that that ability to do that either financially, you know, support wise or even physically. I think I'm probably a genetic freak. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I remember starting my job in corporate and just being like, holy beige. <laughs> Everything mm -hmm. was beige, the walls were beige, mm -hmm. the, like the, the attitude in the room was beige. It was just, I don't know, that's, the, the best way I found to explain it. Um, and it just, I felt like I was, I don't know, living someone else's life. 
like I said, I, I would have been just fine, but I just felt like I worked really hard to get to this place of what was supposed to feel like success and I didn't. So at 30 years old, I wasn't married, you know, didn't have anybody to, you know, depend on me. So I thought, why don't I give this a go? Um, Cause it's probably the last opportunity I'll get to just YOLO a little bit, you know? So mm-hmm. I went for it. That's incredible. Yep. You, as part of the research for this interview, um, I read something that's, that you said, I think that we can be better at prioritizing the things that get you out of bed in the morning and keep you up at night. Ask yourself, what lights your soul on fire? Because you only get to live this life once. And at the end of it, I want to have the most epic story to tell. I think it's going pretty well. It is. <laughs> and like you found at 30, what lights your soul on fire? Yep. And it just happens to be a winter sport. <laughs> <laughs> it was a historical moment in the 2018 Winter Olympics because it was the first time that black athletes won gold, silver, and bronze medal in the same event. You won the silver medal. Describe that. What it felt like to be not just just not just to win the silver medal, but to be part of such a historical moment. I think in the moment, we, I don't think we realized it was that historical. It's actually only until this past Olympics happened that people that I heard about it, you know, because when you're at the Olympics, you don't really hear a lot of the things that go on outside of the Olympics. Mm-hmm. It's very much a bubble. Um, but I do remember uh, we uh, we came down second to last sled because we do reverse order. So we were in second going to the fourth run. I remember thinking, I'm an Olympic champion. This is awesome. And then I remember watching the clock as our opponent came through. And the pilot, um, Mariama Yamanka, is from Germany. She's half black. And I just remember picking her up because I just remember thinking, like, you know, every country has its own issue with race. And I think Germany is definitely one of them. And I I know how hard she fought um, to get to that place. So if I had to be beat by somebody, I guess I'm glad it was her. Um, the only other person I would have liked to be beat by maybe is my own teammate. Um, they took fifth, and Jamie's the pilot. She was my best friend, so that would have been cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's always it's always fun to make history. It's always great to be the first, but I think it's more important that it continues to happen. And the best part is, is the same number of black athletes won those three medals this go around, which I think is pretty neat. That's incredible. Yeah. So you didn't realize at that moment, you d- you you didn't realize the historical significance of it? No clue. It, really? Yeah, I think most people... At what point did you realize that? When, when someone told me. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people that that make history or do big things, I don't, I don't know that anybody gets into it being like, I'm mm-hmm, here to make history. Right, right. Just like, I want to go to the Olympics. And That's you something. just want to win and, you're, right. and you almost get in a bubble. Was it a bubble for you? Do you feel like just the training... And even just your event, the bobsledding event, do you feel just that a, a, was a bubble in and of itself? Yeah, you just you're really just focused on what you need to do and what you're trying to accomplish and how you show up and your your preparation. Mm-hmm. Um, there are 17 people. Of my friends and family came to watch. There half of them I didn't see because you just you yeah. don't have time and bobsled's hard to watch and people have different schedules. So I saw photos of people there that came to support. So yeah, it's very much a bubble. I saw my parents maybe twice. While what I was, was there. what was training like? Um, it depends on the type of the, the time of year. So in the off season, we train like Olympic sprinters and Olympic uh, weightlifters. So a lot of sprinting, mm-hmm. lifting heavy things. We have to be fast and explosive because we're basically propelling a sled downhill on ice. And then during winter, you add in the complexities of being at a track all day and sliding. So actual bobsledding, we only do maybe two minutes a day, which is crazy. And then there's all this other stuff that needs to get done, like sled moving, sled maintenance, driving Mm -hmm. from stop to stop, sports med. um, So you get your treatments and your rehabs Mm -hmm. and things Mm -hmm. like that. And then like actual physical training. But during the winter season, Mike, is it, I think I read that you're training eight to 10 hours a day at a minimum. Yeah, I mean, that's probably a rough estimate. Uh-huh. I think it just depends on the day. So um, usually it's a couple hours of sprinting, there's a couple hours of lifting, and then you're at the track for like 
two to three hours and then you have like rehab stuff and then you have mm-hmm. treatment so it's not like eight to ten hours okay. straight but yeah it's a, part of it it's is a, also the recovery time. yeah it's a full-time jump for sure it just seems so incredibly difficult and exhausting i mean for your mind and body to sustain such physically taxing work i mean it's it seems incredibly difficult yeah i mean i think yeah, it probably is, but, but it's also fun. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. It's just it's what it's I love to do too. Yeah. Right. So I never really saw it that way. the The only part I didn't like was the cold. I do not like cold. But it's partly too because you grew up in California, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even like getting in the pools. <laughs> it's cold. I don't like cold water. I don't like temperature. I don't like it to be warm. Where do you train now? Uh, well, I just retired. So I've been training for the past four years down in Chula Vista. There's mm-hmm. the Elite Athlete Training Center. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually there now because I just had bilateral hip labrum surgery. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm doing my rehab there, which is great because it's like a second home. You mentioned you do dry needling mm-hmm. and chiropractic massage. What's that like? Explain what dry needling is. Dry needling, dry needling is basically like a more targeted form of acupuncture okay so they'll find a tight muscle take a very thin needle and stick it right in there and sometimes they'll move it up and down or connect it to stim or twist it um, to unbound the the fascia and the muscle i'm a big believer in acupuncture yeah I, I mean i whenever i get headaches sometimes i get migraine headaches i feel like that's just like I, I go to this amazing chinese doctor that mm-hmm. studied you know just chinese medicine and yeah. is, and is game, I mean, the acupuncture really helps me. Yeah, so. no, I'm a huge fan. It's uh, the, p- for me, the best thing that I've ever discovered, because um, I'm just very tight. Like, but you've muscly. also, <laughs> you've had surgery. So you yep. had two surgeries, hip surgery. Did that, did that come from the, just the bobsledding work? I think it came from 30 years of being an elite athlete. I've been, I started playing soccer at like seven or eight. Yeah. And I'm 38 now, so. It's a long time to it wears on your body. Beat up your body. Yeah. So thank you, body, for holding know, it down for me. <laughs> I know. I mean, that's something that you know. It's I've never. I mean, I'm not an a elite athlete like you, but like I, I like to run. I like to work out and train. I, I train for two hours every weekend with my trainer, and you know, it's it's hard. It's intense, but I've Absolutely. also realized that at 42, like that's. Your body just needs a lot more recovery and it breaks down more. Real quick. It, it really does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how do you, I mean, this has been your, I mean, your body is almost like you're almost like a surgeon. I mm-hmm. mean, your body is your tool. How do you both are able to make it just work for you, but also take care of it and nurture it? Um, I think it's important to listen to your body. I'm very strong willed, so I want what I want, but as you get older, if you don't listen to it and take care of it, it will not do what you want it yeah. to do. It's just, you know, there's limitations to everything. It's, yeah. So I think it's really important to listen to it. It's important to hydrate. It's important to do all the little things. So how do you listen to your body? Um, What do you do? Like one of the things I do is when I get a headache or when I when I have pain, like I don't like taking pain medication. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't like taking Advil until unless it's like really really bad because i believe like taking advil it's like almost like taking the fire alarm and turning the battery out of that so for me like pain actually tells your body yeah but that's one version of like what i do to listen to my body what would you say i try and get more sleep i try and drink more water (laughs) how much sleep how much sleep do you i don't get it i'm a terrible sleeper why i actually just did a podcast on sleep really Um, it's so important yeah. Especially as an athlete, I yeah. mean, you need that. That's the recovery time. Like being 100%. the sleeping is the real recovery time. Yeah, I have a I have a whoop. So my whoop measures my strain and recovery. Okay. So that's really helpful because it tells me like how many hours of sleep I've gotten, if it's REM sleep, if it's um, deep sleep, mm-hmm. how long it took me to fall asleep. Uh, how many hours would you of sleep would you say you get? Oh. Uh, I'd love to get eight. I'd probably get six to seven. Okay. So I just, I have trouble staying asleep. Yeah. But if you're pushing your body to those limits, I mean, extreme training, I mean, Mm -hmm. the training that an Olympic athlete does is like on such a different level than what just, just normal people do. I'm sure you need also like a high amount of recovery and rest and 
Yeah, it's interesting because I I'm able to do a lot on very little. So would my body perform more better, not more, but better on more sleep? Probably. Mm -hmm. But I'm also pretty impressed on what it's done with like what I've given it. Um, Because everybody needs, I think, a different amount of sleep. And I think sometimes too much sleep isn't great either. Mm -hmm. And there is a certain amount of tension that I find is really important in my body in order to perform well. Right. Because I'm doing elastic, explosive movements. so that's something I worked with a lot of people that are much smarter than me in those areas uh, around, you know, a nutritionist, a coach, sleep specialist. I've done a number of sleep studies. I have a CPAP machine. I've gotten my tonsils removed, deviated septum repaired. Like I traveled with a pregnancy pillow, not pregnant, uh, eye mask, earplugs, CPAP, mattress pad, you know, so I I did literally uh, essential oils. I did everything humanly possible um, to get enough sleep. So that's also a full time job sleeping. <laughs> well, it's but then it's from sleeping and resting and recovering. You then have to go, you know, especially what you do be it's super explosive and and almost like sprint and just be have your body just be able to go into these just extremely high intensity yep. moments. So it's it's an interesting like balance of like really calming yourself down and you know just doing everything you can so you can sleep long, but then right. also being able to rev yourself up and get yourself going. Right. So to that, um, let's talk about nutrition. Okay. You say you have you you have a nutritionist. Had yes. Or you had a nutritionist. Mm-hmm. What is do do you have different eating schedule while you, you know you were you're training for an event versus when you're not? Yeah, unfortunately, I had to be 170 pounds to compete. And some people out there are like, that's a lot of weight. Well, my body likes to be 185, which is what I am now. And you're muscular. Yeah. And so that was tough because I love food. And so having to be very strict for the past eight years was tough. Um, I don't recommend being on a restrictive diet for any long period of time. Uh, I think it messes with your head Mm -hmm. and it definitely messes with your body. Yeah. But um, we tried to do it as safely as possible. So that's why different nutritionists, different eating plans. I ate a lot of the same thing every day. What did you eat? For breakfast, it was like six egg whites and like oatmeal every day. And But luckily, I love plain oatmeal. So that Mm. works out well. Um, Yeah. And then some kind of like lean protein and like white rice or in broccoli, spinach. I had a lot of spinach. So it just it just depends on the day. It's a little tougher when you travel because you know dietary restrictions in Europe are different, mm. right? Uh, so you can't get the same uh, amounts of protein that you may get in the U.S. that you would want need in Europe, just because like their their portion sizes are different. So, and you have stated too that that during the past eight years you have actually had to starve yourself. Oh yeah, to be able to make the. Uh, weight limit and yeah what was like would you just not eat just go long periods of time without eating is that what you would do no i definitely ate every single day and i definitely don't i don't want to lay it out because i don't want someone to look at this and be like "Ooh, i'm gonna try that definitely do not do that um 10 out of 10 do not recommend (laughs) i just would eat less and then you know if a race was in the morning maybe i'd skip breakfast because with bobsled, it's not like we get weighed in ahead of time and then you go. It's you go down the hill and then you get on a scale. And so it's you, your partner, and the sled. And so then you, you I'd bring food with me to the track and mm-hmm. eat after the first run. And how would you mentally prepare for your competitions? You know, you're, you're, you sleep. There's all the pre-training you have to do before. Mm-hmm. Right? Like all the training, the sleep, the nutrition. But is there something that you do before, like a ritual, like meditation or or listening to music or amping yourself up just to get to that zone that you have to be just for that competitive zone? Honestly, I think training really hard every single day is what got me excited for race day because really? it was like putting to test everything that I'd put into getting ready to race. Yeah. Do you Did you ever do a meditation or any sort of ritual? uh to get you there like you talked about visualization like mm-hmm. you would look at videos of yourself and just see what a good hit feels like 
Yeah, so that was always pre-race. Race day, it's just you just you're an athlete. You just compete. Like on race day, there's no time for visual visualization for me mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. The pilots visualize a lot because they have to drive down the track, but I push a sled hop in. And so I think sometimes people can get, and this is my opinion, can get too into all the little things that make a perfect performance yeah. and most performances are never going to be perfect so i work really hard to prepare every single day so that on game day or on race day it was just this is what you've prepared for you were relaxed yeah. it was just like okay i'm gonna give it everything yeah I it's now. supposed to be like race day is fun yeah yeah was it fun before all the races like all the training before yeah like i mean i i don't hopefully you don't do something for eight years that you don't enjoy <laughs> yeah i generally enjoyed most of my training like I said, the thing I hated most was being out in the cold. <laughs> Did your coaches, like, would you say your coaches really helped you? Or was there one particular coach that helped you? Or was it really just more yourself and your own determination that says, you know, I really want to do this? Oh, I definitely don't think an, uh, you can become an Olympic medalist without a lot of help. What is it? It says, they say it takes a village to raise a child. I think it takes really? a, a village and to raise an Olympic medalist. So, yeah, I mean, I have the most incredible support system. My personal coach is, uh, was BJ Cole. He's out of Toronto, um, speed coach. So he, you know, he did all my like weight training and, and, you know, just speed training type of programming. And what do you think coaches do? I mean, are they able to help with your mental toughness, build that up? Are they help, are you able to help you overcome a weakness, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think I think coaches can do all of those things. I think the most important thing a coach needs to be able to do is to understand what their athlete needs. Mm -hmm. So I never really had, I never struggled with mental toughness. I climbed out of my crib at eight months old. So wow, you know, <laughs> okay, a little strong. So you were very strong from the start. You had that. Yeah, if anything, I was probably too hard on myself. So I think what my specific coaches really helped me with is I was always a very strong athlete. I wasn't very technically refined. So that piece was really helpful. And BJ, my coach, really helped me a lot with that. And do you think that's why you were able to be successful starting at 30 years old and winning an Olympic medal? Is And that was at 33, right? Mm -hmm. Is because you just yourself already had like a lot of mental toughness already? Do you think that it came from that? Yeah, I think mental toughness is a big piece of it. I think... You know, being coachable is a big piece of it. I remember I sat down with my teammate. I competed with Alana Myers Taylor, who is the most decorated Black Winter Olympian. Um, and she said, "This is what you need to do to be successful." And so I just listened to somebody who mm -hmm. had more experience than me. So I think being strong-willed is important, but there's that mix of like being mentally tough, but also being coachable right. and being open to learning from people who have done what you're trying to accomplish. So you think it's more possible to see another, you know, when people who are watching this, listening to this, and they're 28 years old, mm -hmm. and they're like, you know what, maybe I want to try out for the Olympics. You know, do you think it's possible for other people? It's This is not an anomaly. In no, I mean, I think I think anything is possible in some degree it how badly do you want it mm -hmm. how hard are you willing to work for it and how realistic are you with yourself about what you need to do to get there i mean i always say everybody can have their own olympic moment right so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be in sports the olympics are great but there are a lot of amazing things out there um, that that one can take on and accomplish but to your point of what you have to do to get there mm. one of the things that i discovered while researching this um, this interview was that 80% of Olympians and Olympic trainees live below the poverty line. Yeah, so I'm not sure if that's the exact stat. That's the stat I've always used, but a, a large percentage of Olympians, Paralympians, and Olympic hopefuls, yeah. That's incredible. In the U.S. specifically. That's, I mean, it's incredible because the Olympic makes billions of dollars a year in revenue, yet According to my research, only $3.4 million are given to the 205 Olympic teams. I'm surprised it's that much <laughs> that, is, that goes to the Olympic teams. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a business. Um, 
Yeah. That it's utterly baffling that the Olympians, who are the pride and joy of our nation, are barely paid enough to put food on the table. Yeah, and then until recently, we they Olympians. I was lucky enough to be after the change, but Olympians had to pay taxes on their really? uh, on their medal winnings. Why do you think there is so little financial support through the International Olympic Committee? So, you mean from the IOC? Yeah. I don't know that it's necessarily the IOC's job. I think the IOC brokerages, you know, deals with each country's Olympic, you know, group. And then our U.S. Olympic team or the USOPC decides how the money is spent. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't have a lot of insight into the inner workings of like how the money flows. I know that, you know, sponsors pay a lot of money to have their logos showed, which is, you know, great for them. Mm -hmm. And then they spend money on sponsoring specific athletes. So there are some athletes that do get, you know, supported quite well, which is great. Um, you know, I wouldn't take anything away from those athletes. They deserve it. Um, but the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic team is one of the few Olympic committees and Paralympic committees that isn't government funded. And so I think that is the toughest piece is that, you know, we have a lot of really talented athletes in the U.S and on both the Olympic and the Paralympic side. And how do you divvy up funds to support everybody? Because you don't know who's gonna go to the games. There's a little bit of luck in that, you know, someone mm -hmm. could get injured or, or what have you. Um, and so all of the money that goes to athletes is heavily relied upon by donors and sponsors that want to support the Olympic movement in the United States. and. We have some incredible donors and sponsors. Um, I got a chance to spend a, a good amount of time with them in Park City and in Montana during the Beijing Olympics, just you know, being able to say thank you. And so it's just, it's expensive, right? It's expensive to live in the US. It's expensive yes, it to do a lot of these sports. I mean, bobsled can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to find a sled that's fast enough. And to be honest, we are behind in sled production in the US. And, Sled manufacturing is a big piece of why I'm not an Olympic champion and I'm a silver medalist. Do I take anything away from my silver medal? Absolutely not, but it's a fact, right? Germany is ahead of us. Because you didn't have the training, the tools to be able- The training, yes. We were there in the training because we outpushed them by like eight tenths of a second, but they just have better equipment in Germany because yeah. bobsled is a sport that is a priority sport, right? Like we're competing against basketball and football. Mm -hmm and soccer and uh, hockey, which is, I love all those sports too. Um, so yeah, it's just, there's a lot that goes into why, mm -hmm. I guess is my answer. <laughs> my very long-winded answer. Yeah, it's definitely complicated. What did you have to do to make ends meet before you got sponsorships? Yeah, well, luckily I have a, a background in sales. And so, you know, I started very early, just cold calling companies that I really liked. Um, and there were some companies that, you know, took me on as a sponsor very early on before I had won really anything. Wow. So before yeah. you even won an Olympic medal, you could just cold called companies yeah. then, and you just said, listen, I'm, I'm, you know, in these championships, this mm -hmm. is what I'm doing. Will you sponsor me? Yeah. That's I created, amazing. I created like uh, packages. So, you know, I agreed to a certain number of social posts or Instagram takeovers. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of public speaking. Mm -hmm. So I'd speak at events. Um, so yeah, I'm. I'm very fortunate to have the skills and the support to be able to support myself. Well, that's your sales skill too. Like yeah. you had your, you know, you took all of the, your sales experience working in corporate America, understanding mm -hmm. just like how the business world works and you right. were able to apply that. But not a lot of other, I mean, a lot of other Olympic athletes who started maybe training very, very young, didn't go into the corporate world, maybe mm -hmm. didn't even go to college. Right. They, like, they don't have those no. opportunities. <laughs> so. What do other kind, what kind of jobs do Olympians get usually if they aren't able to get sponsored? I mean, anything that will take them part time. So a lot of people are, you know, they'll work in the restaurant industry. So when they're off season, wow. they'll. So they're just like waiting tables. Yeah, they'll wait wow. tables full time, um, you know, work in department stores or nanny, mm -hmm. um, just any, any company that will take somebody part time or flexible or you know remote i think um before 2020 working from home wasn't or re working remotely wasn't as popular as it is now so 
um, I think opportunities to fund your your Olympic or Paralympic dream were, you know, sparse. Um, so I know, I mean, I know athletes have slept in their cars. I know athletes mm -hmm. that have like, you know, all rented houses and slept on mattresses on floors and eaten peanut butter and jelly sandwiches during the season if they were funding their own seasons. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, if you if you really want it, you'll find a way to do it. Um, but I'm curious to how many incredible, you know, Olympic or Paralympic performances we missed out on because someone just couldn't afford to continue on. So yeah, well, yeah. sponsorships that's where sponsorships helps and, and absolutely and uh, and but even the pay gap in professional sports sponsorship is massive. Yeah, it's pretty it's, big, huh? I it's a sixty six billion dollar market. Yep. But of that $66 billion market, men capture 99.6% of that market and women only capture 0.4%. Yeah. That is astounding. Yeah. You are the spokesperson for Parity Now, an organization that tries to change this disparity. And instead of having women fight over the few limited seats at the table for sports sponsorship, you are trying to grow that table and give every woman a seat. So that is... The fact that of this professional sports sponsorship, which, which is really just how so many of athletes make make the, the their primary source of income, mm -hmm. to know that 0.4 percent of women are are not part of that is incredible. Why do you think there is such an immense pay gap in professional sports? I mean, I think there for a long time there has been a conversation of you know women's sports aren't as exciting as men's sports or you know women people don't watch women's sports which we know isn't true right the women's ncaa march madness final was the most watched you know college basketball um event ever mm -hmm. um so i think it's it's really just about educating people um about the opportunity to watch women's sports creating an infrastructure for people to be able to to support it you know it's if you look on on you know your tv guide or whatever it's so much easier to find a prime time men's game right. on it's a lot harder to find a women's game you can find professional quote unquote professional tag or cornhole um a lot easier than you can find sometimes you know professional basketball for women so I think it's it's companies realizing that there is value in women's athletes, in supporting women's athletes, and sponsoring women's athletes. Um, Parity is amazing. You know they've launched an NFT marketplace to support women athletes in finding other ways to fund their training. They connect athletes uh, for sponsorship opportunities with different brands, and so it's just about people taking an interest in it and then doing the work to provide more opportunities for women. And, you know, sports are, it, it's amazing. I'm, I'm more than an athlete, but I wouldn't be who I was, who I am today without sports. And there's so many little girls that drop out of sports early for whatever mm -hmm. reason, things like getting their period. Ima imagine like your period yeah. stopping you from, yeah. from playing sports. And we know how valuable being in a team sport environment is it teaches for somebody. you so much. I mean, it teaches you yeah. so much in terms of just competition and working in a team and no, learning how to uh, be a leader and how to be a team player yep. and when to just you know help somebody else you know take the glory. Right. I mean, there's so many things that I have learned just how to run a business and you know being you know 100%. running my two businesses like being able to play just just soccer you mm -hmm. know even though it's not not at a high level at all it just it learned so much yeah. so much but that, but it is interesting that culturally m men are more appreciated in professional sports i just why do you think that is i mean is it is it just they're more fun to watch they're it's it's kind of odd maybe to see women play where do you think it, i mean I, I think it's a societal issue right it's like men do this Ooh men do this and women do that and I think we now know that men can do this and that and women can do this and that whatever this and that is right? yeah. whether um, you know a man works and their wife stays home or vice versa I think that you know social norms 
are hopefully being broken down and realizing. Do you think it is being broken down? And, and do you think they're culturally women are being women sports are are more appreciated, are more elevated? Um, I think we have a lot of work to do. I think I think there are a lot of people trying and no one is trying harder than the pro women athletes. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, the women's national soccer team, the WNBA, um, women's hockey, even, you know, women's bobsled is very small, but we do our own thing. We tried to get four women bobsled so that more women would have an opportunity to compete in the Olympics like the guys do. Mm -hmm. They gave us mono bob instead, which is just one person, which didn't really, <laughs> didn't, wasn't really what we were looking for. But I think, you know, it's going to start with women and then it's going to start with people who realize, hey, there's a lot of value in pro women sports and they're fun to watch mm -hmm. and women are incredible athletes. And the crazy thing about pro women athletes is that we don't have the luxury of just playing our sport. You know, it's not like we can just focus on our sport. My teammate has a two year old, you know, mm -hmm. and competed for the past right. two years with a little boy who came with us. I call him my emotional support. Oh, buddy. that's He's beautiful. Best. He's the best human I've ever met. Um, so yeah, it just, women are capable of doing whatever we want to do um and given the opportunity and the support we'll surprise you 10 out of 10 times but i do think it starts with money the money too it's like do people do people want to watch women's sports and i think i think the more like the wnba mm -hmm. and the women's soccer the more you see those organizations like more women not just women but also men yeah you know it has to it has to the more we can show that i think the more money there could be towards that helping that disparity absolutely what is parity now doing to help mitigate that pay wage gap yeah parity does a really great job of finding sponsorship opportunities for pro and athletes that normally wouldn't come to them mm -hmm. um, because generally women have in some instances, smaller Instagram accounts, right? And, or social media accounts. And so some companies only wanna work with the massive athletes, but there are some really incredible stories to be told on those micro influencers. Um, and so Parity does a really good job of doing that. Also starting an NFT marketplace, because mm -hmm. usually a opportunity like that comes to women after it's been around for men. And yeah. so- I think they look to to create something their own, their self because there wasn't really anything out there that was specifically focused on helping women create NFTs, educating women on NFTs, and then helping women sell NFTs. So I think I was the first bobsledder to sell an NFT. Really? Yep. Okay, that's last that's, fall. So that was pretty really, cool. That's so. Tell me about that. What did you sell? What was your NFT? My NFT was a it was a, a beautiful photo of me done by uh, incredible photographer Sam Queskin. Uh -huh. And then Borbe, who was the artist that did it out of New York, um, he it was a black and white photo. He took a bunch of photos from my Instagram and kind of overlaid it here in my kind of chest area. And then there was some just video of me on the push track um, training for bobsled mm -hmm. and then some audio over it as well. And I, if you ask me what the audio said, I can't remember, <laughs> but the title of the NFT is uh, This Is Me. So. Oh, yeah, it's that's exciting. Great. That's great because it, it is something too that culturally we're seeing like Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. NFTs. That's also more traditionally men are more have been more into that. Right. But it's great to see this. The parody now is actually mm -hmm. encouraging women to have yep. their own NFTs rather than it just be just more focused on men. Yep. How are they adding more seats to the table? said that they're adding more seats adding to the table. more seats to the table i think that by specifically looking for opportunities for women because mm -hmm. a lot of these women that we work with there are 700 pro women athletes 700 plus pro women mm -hmm. athletes that are part of the parity community and because some of them are in like i'll call them like the fringe sports right they're not in the major like basketball mm -hmm. you know soccer football sports they don't have agents and so usually you have to be at a certain quote unquote caliber of athlete and caliber really just means popularity of athlete in order to get represented. And so what parody does is help these athletes that normally don't have a, you know, an agent to speak for them or negotiate for them and do it on their behalf and then bring them opportunities so they can focus mm -hmm. on their sports um, and still have opportunities to, you know, work with and promote other companies. To a young athlete that wants to see about trying to, 
see if they can make a career out of being in professional sports. Would you recommend, there's so much money in the big sports, basketball, Mm -hmm. soccer, volleyball, but some of these other smaller sports that you call the French sports Mm -hmm. that might be less competitive, but there's also a lot less money in it. Where would you, what would you recommend to a young athlete that maybe isn't as like such a superstar athlete to get, you know, be able to compete at a basketball level or a soccer level, volleyball level, but it really has, a, it's, it's a good athlete. Mm-hmm. And maybe it could possibly be a professional athlete by going into some of these other lesser known sports. Is there an opportunity there? Would you, would you make your recommendation as there needs, you know, there is an opportunity in some of these smaller I mean, it's hard. I think as an athlete, in order to get to the highest level in any sport, I truly believe you have to love it. Mm -hmm. So So it's based on that. Yeah. So I think if you're just doing a, because we've seen it, I've seen people come into bobsled because they hear it's a quicker path to the Olympics than most sports because no one, not no one, most people don't grow up bobsledding. Um, But they generally don't do all that well. So I think... First Maybe because first. they don't like it. They, yeah. They're just their passion isn't it. Yeah, I think first things first, you should, younger athletes should do sports that they love. And I, it's interesting to me how specialized younger athletes are now. I never mm. specialized. I did all sports. I wanted to do all sports. I played soccer. I ran track. You know, I loved soccer. I realized I wasn't great at it. You know, tried softball. Wasn't great at basketball either not a great swimmer, not very buoyant, but I tried it, you know, so I did a lot of different things and I never meant to specialize. Honestly, my first love was, was figure skating, but at 5'10 and 185 pounds, <laughs> I don't think it's in the cards for me. Um, so I would just say to younger athletes, like you need to remember why you started that sport. And if the reason you started that sport no longer exists and you're not enjoying it, then you should probably go do something else. Yeah. You know, the Olympics isn't for everybody and that's okay. Right. But to my point earlier, Everyone can have their own Olympic moment. So it's not even about trying to find a, oh, I, you know, this is not a very well known. My chances it would be easier to get into this area. It's really just, it has to be something that you really, truly, truly enjoy. That's what's getting to drive. I mean, to each their own. That's just not how I would approach it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it has to, you know, it's what, what motivates you. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, it has to be like something that every single day, even when it's hard, you're, you're willing to get out and train. Yep. Like I remember years ago, I did a triathlon and I realized like pretty quickly that like the swimming part, like I just did not like, Yeah. you know, like I love the biking. <laughs> I love the swimming. I love the biking. I yeah, love the running. running. Those are, and then I loved running. That's you when I realized like I really enjoyed enjoy running. being clobbered by a bunch of people in, in like dirty water. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't enjoy that. Yeah. And then at that point, I was just like, okay, you know, it doesn't make, you know, maybe I just, this will be my last like, you know, triathlon yeah. I do. And then it's just, then I just learned to focus on running and bike riding. Yeah. And then I realized like I really like running a lot and then kind of put, you know, focused on mm-hmm. that. But I, I realized that if you don't really love something, you're just not going to do it. Correct. I mean, for me, at least. Yeah. After you won the Olympics, it must have been this like high moment. Like what was, how long did that high last for you? Just just the the realization that you're an Olympic? I don't no. think it's worn off yet. Really? <laughs> That's yeah, great. Four years later. That's wonderful. It's, I mean, I think especially when you don't grow up trying to go to the Olympics and you try out for something as a joke. I don't know that that will ever wear off. I mean, I don't sit around thinking about the fact that I went to the Olympics every day, but I would do wear my Olympic ring every day. So oh, that's it's beautiful. A fun little that, that's in the, that's yeah. And after that, though, you you say you're retired now. Mm-hmm. And what are you doing now? Are you doing other spawns? Are other training for other kinds of events? Or are you working for the organizations now? Or yeah, are, are how, how are you still like? actively training if you're not in the Olympics now? So right now I'm recovering from bilateral hip labrum surgery. Shout out to Dr. Philippon at Stedman Clinic. Um, I'm about three weeks out from my second one and eight weeks out from my first one. So my training's a lot different. It's just hip rehab now. So that's why I'm down in at the training center in Chula Vista. Um, And then I work full time for an incredible organization called Heroic. I'm the VP of partnerships. 
And our mission is to help 51% of the world flourish by 2051. And I understand that that term flourish, like what does that mean? Um, we're all about helping people get to the most heroic version of themselves. Um, I hear people all the time personally say, you know, if I could just do this better, if I could just do that better. And so we launched an app that is going to help people just do this or just do that a little bit better. And so it's about who you show up as every day and your work, your love and your energy, the virtues that are tied to those identities and then the small actions you take daily. And what does the Heroic app exactly do to help you shift that mindset? Yeah, so what I love about the Heroic app is it allows you to figure out who you are, but also who you want to be. So one of the things I always said when I was training for the Olympics is that everything you do is either going to push you closer to your goal or pull you further away. Mm -hmm. And the way I got to the Olympic podium was focusing on all the little small details, right? It was making sure I was hydrated, making sure I went to bed on time, uh, making sure I did my rehabs, making sure I did my recovery, making sure I ate well, um, making sure I wasn't on my phone all day. And so you can put all those little things into the app and every time you complete something, you get to swipe it. Mm -hmm. And it's got the same haptic sensation that like the Apple products do. And so it's awesome. And you can see how many people around the world are also hitting similar targets. Uh, I think we hit uh, 1 million you know, uh, annual recurring virtues two days after our app launch, which was really cool just to see how many people are excited about showing up as the most heroic versions of themselves. And is it something that you set, like you set these things into the app and then the app will just give you like reminders, gentle reminders. And then once you complete it, you're like, okay, this is something that I've done to get to that heroic version of myself. Exactly. So you wake up in the morning and you recommit to your identities, you recommit to your virtues and you recommit to your actions. And Great. so you don't work out every day. So, you know, hip rehab isn't a target yeah. that I put every day, yeah. but I need to drink water every day. Yeah. So that is a target that I, that I put in every day. And then as soon as you do it, you get to swipe it and it shows you your streaks, how many other people are doing it. So, we're looking to launch a social portion of it in October, which will be really mm -hmm. cool to just connect with other people who are also trying to be the most heroic versions of themselves. How did it get created? What was the thought process behind that app being created? Yeah, I don't know the full thought process because that genius lies with uh, Brian Johnson, our founder. He actually started Optimize years ago, but he does tell a story of on election night uh, a few years back. Mm -hmm. uh, he just was not happy with what our world and our, our society was looking like and he felt like it wasn't a place that he wanted to raise his children in so he decided he wanted to do something about it um and that's kind of how the, the how heroic and the app began um through that one night and that feeling of well if i'm not happy with it i need to do something about it mm -hmm. which is very much what the app is all about right what, what i like about it is that it actually also makes you hold yourself accountable to these things every day it's not just a visualization exercise right. it's not just like okay i'm going to try to do these things it's like okay i've done it and now i can see all these other people who've done right. something similar too yeah but hopefully not not to a uh, not to a place where like things don't go perfectly mm -hmm. you're not it's beating life. yourself up about it right um becoming the most heroic version of yourself is always going to be a journey it's never going to be an endpoint and it's never going to be perfect and so um we hope that people just really enjoy connecting with other people who are like-minded in the sense that we're all just trying to better ourselves. Is there an element of like the personal part of it, just the, you know, the, the mind, just the, the, the meditation, the personal development, not just like you're trying to achieve your goals, but also balancing your life outside of your work. Absolutely. And I think that's why it's such a my hope is that in my role i'll be able to bring this app to companies as a as a, as a piece of like a corporate wellness because mm. i think the piece that some programs miss is that they only focus on who you are at work mm -hmm. right exactly if you have not figured out who you are at home and in your love how can you show up as the most heroic version of yourself at work and so it's kind of like maslow's hierarchy of needs right mm. before i can be my best in any setting, I have to know that my foundation is set and that's our homes and our love and our energy. And so, you know, we are working on a case study now with 
all of our heroic founding members we have about twelve thousand people who who signed on to be part of the app before it was even launched and so in 30 days, we want to be able to say, if you use Heroic, you will be more connected, energized, and productive, and that Heroic helps you flourish. I think it's great that there's a personal element of it as well, because it's not just your life. And to be successful in your work life, in your professional life, you have to have a balanced home life. You have to be yep. able to have a balanced like self-care, mental health. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's that's excellent. Yeah. So who is Lauren Gibbs at home? When you're not training, when you're not uh, working towards achieving these incredible uh, just goals, how, how what's your downtime look like? Um, I'm I'm a pretty big goofball. Like <laughs> I spend a lot of time talking to my mom and my dad actually. Um, do you have brothers or sisters? I do have an older brother. Uh-huh. He is a voiceover artist. Great. He's the successful one in the family. That's what I always say. <laughs> your parents must be so proud. Oh, they're. <laughs> Whatever they did as parents, <laughs> like they need to write a book. Yeah, they um, do. Yeah, I don't know. I have the most amazing friends. I, last night I spent a few hours at my friend's house. We've been friends since we were four. Um, and now she has two kids and a husband. And so we are just catching up. And so I have friends all over the country and all over the world because I keep exactly. moving around. Yes. And so I do my best. And I think for me, like that's something that's that I love about the app is like my love targets is appreciate someone and encourage someone. Mm-hmm. Um, so I try and do that every single day. And so I spend a lot of time just chilling too. I'm actually an introvert, so I don't I don't get lonely and I, I just like to I am too. Low. Well, yeah. I am too. Like I find that I, I enjoy being in social gatherings, mm-hmm. social settings, but for me to just recharge myself, right. I need to be by myself or around like very small groups, yeah. you know, small groups of people. Yeah. But to your love targets, are you, are you single? Are you married? Are you dating? Is it? <laughs> I am single. Yep. <laughs> what is it like to date being an Olympic medalist? Um, I wouldn't know because I move around so much yeah. that it's hard to form any kind of relationship with any one person. Yeah. It's also hard because you don't know where you're gonna you're end gonna go up, next. right? And so that's been a little bit tough, but. You know, that's what I signed up for. Well, it's, yeah. is there something like an Olympic tender or something for people who are in your position, who are yeah. traveling, who are at such a, these like peak, like just, you have to be performing at such a peak level. It must be really hard to try to meet somebody, you know, like, let's say a, like your brother, like a voiceover yeah. actor. And like, it's such a different life than what you have to live. Yeah, with. I mean, uh if there is one i don't know of it maybe i'm just not that cool of an olympian um but yeah i think there's there's different dating platforms that are for very busy people they're just like the elite i don't know how you you have to apply to them or something but even just meeting people just organically through you know you talked about you spend time with your with with your friend you know Mm -hmm. since you're four years old and he's married um is that a goal that you want to have? Sometime? To get married and have kids? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it happens. I mean, yeah, if, if it happens, that would be great. If it doesn't, then, you know, I have a lot of things in my life that's great, yeah. too, that are great. I also think about just your friendships. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, for someone that else is just, I find having, like, when I came to L.A. 12 years ago, I did not know anybody here. Yeah. So I didn't have any family members here. Mm-hmm. And I also think developing your friendships, your network of just very loyal friends yeah. has been really important too. Like that's partly what also I believe in balance is, is having a network of just small friends that you can rely on. Yeah. And, and even if when you do travel, um, you, you know, you, you might not, see them all the time but then you when you talk to them on the phone or you see them it's like not much not not much time right goes by i mean we're yeah. truly great friends like that yeah i i mean i have the best friends in the world i'm the luckiest person i know i want to talk about money okay and and you said you never really you were making a lot of money mm-hmm. before you you know when you did this joke when you tried but Money wasn't really a motivating factor for you when you tried out for the no. Olympics, right? Mm-mm. And it's a good thing because it wasn't a lot there. <laughs> yeah, but you also said that money cannot buy the feeling I feel every morning, 
competing on a national competition with the letters USA on my back. Money cannot buy the physical, mental, or emotional transformation. Yeah. What does it feel having the letters USA on your back? I think for any athlete, the dream is to compete for something bigger than yourself. And that's what that is to me. Um, my hope is that I'm competing for other little girls that look like me and are, you know, maybe in a situation where they don't feel supported or that things are possible, that anything is possible. And so I think it's less, less than those three letters, but what those letters that, and the people that those letters represent, um, you know, because we're a very diverse country and to your point earlier in 2018, that was the first time that, you know, three black athletes, that black athletes won medals in each category. And so, um, you know, my hope is that because I've lived such a charmed life and, you know, have had the opportunities that I've had that now I can pay it forward and the ability to do that on a worldwide stage is, is pretty cool. And I don't take, I never took that opportunity for granted. Um, you know, we live in a social media culture where everything's supposed to be polished and pretty all the time. And so I try and show up as often as possible with my hair unbrushed and no makeup on, no makeup on today. Um, You're beautiful. Thank you. You're really beautiful. And then just show people that like, you know, you can look different ways in different stages mm -hmm. of your life. And you don't, I don't always have six pack, six pack, six pack abs right now. They're on vacation. <laughs> um, and that's okay. And so I just, I just try and show up as Lauren all day, every day, um, and hope that my story and how I present myself inspires someone else to do something in their own life that will, you know, put them in a position to be the best version of themselves. And that's the transformation. Yeah. You talked about transformation and how you are very different than you were before, you know, before you started training. Yeah. How would you say you've grown since taking that, that joke, taking training? Yeah, I think I'm more patient with myself. I was always in a hurry to try and, I don't know, be the most successful without really knowing what, what, how I defined success. And so now I feel like I'm more patient with myself. I feel like hopefully I'm more patient with others and hopefully my focus is on purpose and not so much on myself, which is something one of my mentors told me a long time ago, off self on purpose. And how has this transformation defined your relationship with money and success? I mean, I still love money. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Especially it's, living in California. Especially <laughs> living in Cal, it's really important. Yeah, but um, I think it's I. I've always known that money isn't everything. Um, there is very little value in money, if to me, if you don't also have purpose, mm -hmm. um, because you can't take money with you. Um, but it is a scorecard too and it's a way of just it's a scorecard like going back to the parody now just how the, the payback yeah. in professional sports i mean to see that women are only being given 0.4 percent right. of sponsorships like that's money like that is that's a scorecard that needs to be changed right and that's that's more about equity right it's like it should be equitable mm -hmm. and equal so we, we should all have the same opportunities um but like physical money like the actual money it, so what drives you now, though, now that you're retired? I just love to see what I can do. Like, what new joke? Why not? So what new what new challenge are yeah, you going to take I now? I just like to see, like, what else can I do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think once you figure out a, a recipe for success for yourself, it makes duplicating success more possible. It's still a lot of work, but you can you can do it again and again. And it just comes down to like, for me, how disciplined do I wanna be in whatever it is I'm trying to accomplish? I was watching uh, this incredible documentary on Dr. Dre mm -hmm. and Jimmy Iovine called The Defiant Ones. Mm -hmm. And um, in that 
episode, uh, Dr. Dre says, you know, I'm 50 years old. I've been doing the music for 30 years now. And music is a young man's game. And it got me to thinking about athletes and you in particular. And it's in many, it's a young, it's a young person's game. Mm-hmm. Do you, how do you feel about that? Knowing that just your body breaks down and you can't achieve the same level of just the the physical, you can't do the physical demands, even though your mind maybe wants to do it, your body has just broken down. Like, is there a, is it, what is the fe- what is that feeling to know that your body just you, uh, your body at 38 can't do the things it did at 33 i don't know i'll let you know when i get there <laughs> i'm still not there i mean i competed last season so you did yeah i'm still faster than 99.9 percent of bobsledders in the world do you still think you can win another oh uh, absolutely really? if, I, if i wanted to go back to the olympics yeah, absolutely 100 percent. you said though that it's a lot harder to watch your loved ones play than it is to actually, yeah, than that actually play. <laughs> 100%. Watching my teammates compete in the Olympics was a, a, a fun, but awful all at the same time. Because you're not there and you just no, you want to be out there. Not No, because I want them to do well and I have no control over whether or not that happens. Mm-hmm, like, I, see. I, know the, I know the hard work that everybody, I mean, everybody that goes to the Olympics works hard. I mean, unless you're mm-hmm. complete a complete genetic freak and even those people work hard so you just want people on their big day to have a big day so yeah now over the next five years how do you see your life shifting i don't know i try not to put like strong like limits like that i i focus on showing up as the most heroic version of myself every day mm-hmm. and seeing what that effort leads me to mm-hmm. um you know it was it was different when i was competing in bobsled because there were definite things that you wanted to accomplish but i feel like i've accomplished a lot you have. so um yeah i mean i love real estate i love investing in real estate i love to travel for fun um i have some friends that are going to be giving me new little nieces and nephews soon so mm-hmm. you know i want to i have my own blood niece and nephew my nephew is 14 and like six feet tall my niece is 10 and just like the star of the family and you know so yeah do you ever have a desire to try to coach young athletes or not even a little bit i do not have the patience for that yes it It takes a very special human to be a teacher a coach yeah anything like that and i just i don't know that's in my DNA. That's a really good point. Some yeah. people are much better teachers yeah. and some people just like they, you know, if they have it in themselves, like you can maybe guide them, but th- yeah. it's really hard to yeah. just put that fire mm-hmm. in someone. Okay, we're going to end with just uh, a few rapid fire questions. Sure. What are your top three healthiest habits? Top three healthiest habits. Uh, not like well i won't say not so drinking water is one uh getting some sort of vegetable or fruit and or fruit every day um and telling somebody i love them every day oh i yeah. love that especially that i love them part mm-hmm. we don't say that enough no i have a principle that a part of balance is having healthy vices mm-hmm. What are your top three vices that bring you great joy? Top three vices that bring me great joy. I um, I love real estate. I am obsessed with house hunting. But that's a vice. Yes. Because <laughs> I mean, then you can buy something. You're like, I need to stop <laughs> bu- trying to buy houses. <laughs> um, let's see. I let's see. second one. I love spending time with my family. How is that a vice? Though? I don't know. You said healthy vice. A healthy vice. Like, like I don't. Uh, I don't think spending time with a family is a vice. So, like, what would you? What would you define like, would, as a vice? Like, I what's think an of, example of one of your me, healthy like, vices? P- poker is a vice. Oh, I yeah. love to gamble. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> see, now we're like talking because it's like this. This whole show is about balance, but a oh. big thing about for what I believe in is that you can't have balance without just like 
doing a little bit oh, of things okay. that's a little bad for you. I misunderstood you know? the question. Okay. You know, vices, like I get it. drinking. When you, you know? said healthy vices, I thought you meant like, it's something yeah. that you're addicted to, but it's good for you. <laughs> Carbs. <laughs> okay, I love food. And I, I, I will eat food that's not healthy. I love pizza. It brings you great joy. And I am here to say that I love pizza. <laughs> I love um, pizza too. Let's see. I love to shop. I just bought these new sandals that I probably paid too much money for. And I love to, to travel to warm beaches. What are your play, favorite places to travel to? Um, Tahiti, Spain. I love Spain. Um, Barbados was amazing. Mm -hmm. I really want to go to the Maldives. Um, I mean, I want to go to Europe in the summer because I spent so much time there in the winter. Else. And beaches. You want to go to places like beaches. Yeah. To me, <laughs> no winter places. No. To me, vacation is not going somewhere cold. I mean, I would probably go to Antarctica or a lot because, like, you got to go there once. Mm -hmm. But like, I really want to go to Greece. Greece. Greek food is my one of my oh, favorite cuisines, it. and I want to see the you know Olympic Stadium there. Have that experience. My friend and my friend and I were supposed to go to Peru when the pandemic hit, and obviously that didn't happen. So I would love to check out Machu Picchu. Um, those are beautiful places yeah. it's, it's just m incredible I mean and hiking do the, go do, do the hike yeah you know you can you can take a bus but you actually the, you, the oh. way to see it is just hiking you have to train for that you can remember <laughs> I've very finely tuned to push something for five seconds and then sit down so I have to train for that one oh, but yeah it'll be a fun training yeah. what are small things you do every day to try to achieve balance Small things I do every day. I have a bedtime alarm because if I don't focus on my bedtime, then I am useless the next day. Um, small things. And you can also you know, use the bedtime alarm with a heroic app, right? right? That's great. Yeah, so that's exactly. Yeah. I really work to not, my mom calls it mouth hunger where you just eat because you're bored. <laughs> so I really work to fight my mouth hunger. <laughs> um, just because it's, you know, as you get older, you have to be careful about what you eat. So you can't just be eating, which is one of my vices. Um, third thing. And then again, I know I've said this like three times, but I really focus on my water intake. If you notice, mm -hmm. I've almost finished this bottle of water um, because so many things can be solved with sleep and water. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you mentioned your parents. Mm -hmm. Your how like they just like they should write a book. Yeah. What do you think your parents did that raised that raised you to be who you are? I well, one thing they they let me be me, and I'm sure that was trying because I was a piece of work. Um, they let me express my feelings. We, t we talked about things in my family. My dad's a clinical psychologist, so everybody went to therapy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they allowed me to be real and human and fallible. And they told me they loved me all the time and they hugged me as a kid mm -hmm. and yeah. And that's why you now are telling everyone you love right. them. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah. they taught you that, those are beautiful. Yeah. What does wealth mean to you? Uh, living with purpose and, you know, finding a way to pay it forward. It's beautiful. We like to leave our viewers with what we call a meditation. What is an important life lesson or insight that you have learned that has given you the greatest amount of balance in your life? Uh, life is short. Tell the people that you love them that you love them. That's beautiful, Lauren. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like to leave our viewers and listeners with? Uh, yeah, go check out the Heroic app. Okay. And come join us in helping 51% of the world flourish by 2051. Check out the Heroic app. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much uh, for being on the Mega Podcast. And thank you to our viewers and our listeners. Thank you for your time. And until next time. Thanks for having me.